thank you very much, Ken, and I'm pleased to see that uh, most of the people have made it back from the coffee, as tempting as that was. Uh, could I have the first slide, please? So, um, so we're here to talk about internalizing externalized costs, and, and you know, that's such an abstract concept, isn't it? Particularly with respect to public health. So I thought I'd begin by making it much more personal. I want to ask you a series of questions, and I want you to put your hands up if the answer to those questions is yes, okay? I want you to think about your family. I want you to think about your kids, that circle of close friends, your parents, and I want you to put your hand up if the answer is yes to the following series of questions. How many within that close circle have experienced breast cancer? Put your, put your hands up. What about infertility? What about diabetes or obesity? What about autoimmune diseases? Okay, I could go on in this list. Let me ask one last question. All of you who put your hand up at least once, put it up again and hold it up as you look around and you see what proportion of all of us have been affected by diseases, some proportion of which are being caused by exposure to chemicals. We don't know exactly what proportion, but the science that's emerged over the last 20 years says it is significant. And the good part of that is, actually the interventions are quite simple. We reduce exposures, and that's really good news. So when we look at the externalized costs of environmental chemicals used in, in agrochemistry, we know that those costs are real. We heard earlier how difficult it is to estimate them. If you want to think about being, looking at, at, at a landscape in a fog, and you can just see the barest outlines of a, of a mountain range in the background, this, how big those costs are right now, we don't know if, if they're the Blue Ridge of Eastern North America, we don't know if they're the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas, but we know that they're substantial, they're big, and they're preventable. So we know, what we actually know right now, the hard numbers in the US, for example, a study came out uh, several years ago that said about $1.2 billion a year is caused in, in health costs is caused in the US by exposure to agricultural chemicals. What we know right now is that the current estimates we have vastly underestimate the true costs. Whoops. Only the tiniest fraction of agricultural chemicals have been studied for health effects by independent scientists. Independent, and that's a key thing. There's a marvelous paper written by a London resident, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Antonio, who looked at what happens if you use industry data to estimate the health effects of glyphosate, which is a key player in GMO agriculture? What happens if you look at those data and you restrict your analyses to those data versus what happens if you use the full array of scientific evidence that's available, especially from independent scientists? And the difference is vast. <laughs> Only a small fraction of the plausible health endpoints have been carefully studied from this perspective. Another reason why the, that mountain range is likely to be much bigger than we currently can prove. And finally, only a handful of studies have tried very hard to assess how one can connect the health effects from this science to the economic costs. I'm happy to say that Dr. Leo Trasand here is one of the pioneers in looking at chemical exposures and how you can convert those to economic costs. But there is an even larger elephant uh, in this room because almost all of the estimates to date are based on 
science that's a couple decades old. Over the last two decades, there's been a revolution in the environmental health sciences indicating that the proportion of diseases attributable to chemical exposures is far bigger and more common than what traditional estimates yield. And what this revolution in science is based upon is a field called epigenetics and its doppelganger endocrine disruption. Epigenetics are, are the things that control gene expression. Our genes aren't passive little BBs that live in us for the rest of our lives. They're being turned on trillions of times a second from conception all the way to death. And the timing of expression of genes is absolutely vital, especially, especially in fetal development. And when something, when a gene is turned on at the wrong time, or it fails to turn on at the right time, that can lead to a lifetime of adverse consequences. And endocrine disruption is the is an effect mediated by chemicals that interfere with how hormones work. And hormones are the key signaling agents responsible for making sure that genes turn on and off at the right time. The United Nations is serious about this. They published a report in February of 2013 saying that endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. Now, any of you who know the the WHO, which is where this report came from, that's a conservative agency. And yet they felt the evidence was strong enough to say endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. And I don't have time to review the tens of thousands of scientific papers that have been published on this, in this field over the last 20 years, but I'm gonna extract from you very quickly some of the key points that are relevant to external costs of exposure. And one is that low doses, whoops, low doses matter a lot. The doses at which some of these chemicals are active is in the parts per, low parts per billion level. I'll say a little bit more about that. A second key thing is that events in the womb, exposures in the womb, play out over a lifetime of the individual who's exposed. Some of the, some of the diseases caused by fetal exposure do not manifest until middle or old age. And third, the tools we have used to try and tell us what's safe and what's not, they are deeply flawed. They don't reflect the last 20 years of modern molecular genetics and epigenetics. They're based upon tests that were developed in the 1950s. I'm not exaggerating. They don't reflect other things like the complexity of mixtures, cocktail effects, how it is that the hundreds of chemicals that are in us all the time interact <coughs> because all tests for safety Virtually all tests have been done one chemical at a time, and yet we know that there are interactions, there are additive effects, there sometimes are even larger than additive effects. So, low doses matter a lot. These frogs were exposed to 2.5 parts per billion of atrazine from hatching to when they became adult frogs. 2.5 parts per billion is a low amount. When a farmer puts atrazine on the field to control weeds, they want to get a million parts per billion you can measure atrazine in rainwater at around one part per billion. So these guys look normal, they're mating, except that the one on the bottom is a fully functional male despite being a genetic, excuse me, a fully functional female despite being a genetic male. The conversion was complete as a result of this exposure from genetic male to fully functional female who can reproduce, can lay eggs, and those eggs grow up as fully functional adult frogs. 2.5 parts per billion. That's a big deal. We had a little discussion earlier about obesity. Here's an experiment published by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The mouse on your right is morbidly obese. The mouse on the left is a control animal. The animals ate the same amount of food. They exercised the same amount using scientific assessments of both those parameters and yet the mouse on the right is morbidly obese. It was exposed to one part per billion at birth of a chemical that's become known of a in a class of chemicals called obesogens. We know how they work, at least some of them. They work by 
converting st by taking stem cells, sending the wrong signal to those stem cells, to the genes in the stem cells, and stem cells that would have become bone cells become fat cells. We know this process works in people, and I can go into that detail later. So the good news about this, and actually obesogens are, there are obesogens that are commonly used as fungicides in industrial agriculture. And the science, actually, with those fungicides is the best science on obesogens that exists. So, low level matters. Low levels matter. And what that does is that takes this issue away from just the farm workers into our kitchens. The levels that we can observe in today's produce are in the same levels that we know can cause adverse effects in animals. So this is an issue about us and our families. These are big externalities. We're en route to getting better estimates as to what they are, and we hope to use them as this whole process moves forward to inform it in a way that engage the public because it's about our health. Thank you.